Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Five Patients by Michael Crichton. So this is non-fiction by the guy who wrote Jurassic Park. He also wrote ER, and uh, he had some medical industry experience of his own as well, um, which is where this book comes in. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... ER is the most successful television series ever. Michael Crichton created the series from his own experiences as a medical doctor in the emergency rooms, operating rooms and wards of Massachusetts General Hospital. Five Patients is Michael Crichton's true account of the real-life dramas so vividly portrayed in ER. A construction worker is seriously injured in a scaffold collapse. A middle-aged dispatcher is brought in suffering from a fever that has reduced him to a delirious wreck. A young man nearly severs his hand in an accident. An airline traveller suffers chest pains. A mother of three is diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. Written with the same honesty, suspense, technological detail and excitement that have made Jurassic Park and Airframe number one bestsellers worldwide, Five Patients is an unputdownable account of life as it really is in a hospital. So we're going to go straight into the author's note written in 1994. The book itself I think came out or was written in the late 60s. And um, this is one of the observations that I had reading through this. I think we'll get to it later. He talks about basically what was telemedicine, which is when medicine takes place like over the internet. It's kind of happening now. But um, So he writes here in the author's note, Much of the book focuses on emerging technologies, and it is interesting to see how cutting-edge technologies in the 1960s have fulfilled or failed to fulfill their promises. The use of closed-circuit television for remote doctoring has not found wide application, but some observers think that this is because the technology is still emerging and will reach fruition when a combination of robotics and virtual reality allows surgery to be performed by a surgeon thousands of miles away. And it's just interesting to see again how much, you know, how much it progressed from the 60s to 1994 and then how much it's progressed again in the 30 years since 1994. So he's talking about, um, like pandemics and illnesses, he says, During this past quarter century, we have come to know even more horrific pathogens, such as Ebola virus, which fortunately have not taken hold in Western societies, but the threat remains. And obviously I'm reading this in the context of the COVID era. So we're going to move on to patient number one, Ralph Orlando. So he talks about Asclepius, uh, which is a deified physician who lived in about, I think, about 1350 BC. Um, and that was referenced in, in an episode of Red Dwarf, which is a show I really like, so I thought that was cool. And he also writes, uh, and this is just interesting sort of etymology and history, really. The hospital, in a more modern sense, began in late Roman times and coincided with the spread of Christianity across Europe. The word hospital is derived from the Latin hospes, meaning host or guest. The same route is given as hotel and hostel. Indeed, the first hospitals were little different from hotels and hostels. Essentially, they were places where the sick could rest and be fed until they recuperated or died. All hospitals were run by the church, and most were associated with monasteries. Medicine was practiced by monks and priests. And he's talking about how going to the doctor often killed people. Uh, so we've got here, throughout medical history, physicians have felt that they had precise, specific remedies, but few of these are still acceptable. As medical writer Burton Rueche notes, only three 18th century drugs are still acceptable today. Quinine for malaria, colchicine for gout, and foxglove digitalis for heart failure. All other specifics, as well as what Holmes termed the preemptory drastics, have disappeared. Even as recently as 1910, L.J. Henderson commented that if the average patient visited the average physician, he would have a 50-50 chance of benefiting from the encounter. He also says one of the patient, this patient, John O'Connor, um, there was tenderness to rectal examination, also suggestive of such infection. I mean, I would say most people are tender to rectal examination, right? And he's writing about the way that health insurance in America um, kind of drastically increases the amount that the healthcare system costs, which still happens. Uh, so he says, Dr. John Knowles notes that many Americans are required by law to arrange insurance for their cars. Why should they not also be required to arrange health insurance for themselves? Lest private health insurance seem a financial panacea, one should note that private companies are often irrational in their payment procedures. For example, for many years, one could not collect for certain treatments, such as the setting of fractures, unless one were admitted to the hospital, at least overnight. Thus, a person who might easily receive therapy in the EW and be sent home had to be admitted in order to receive insurance coverage. This unnecessary admission raised the total cost of healthcare, and ultimately such increases are passed on to the consumer in the form of higher premiums. Some of these odd payment procedures have been changed, but not all. 
and indeed it's still definitely something that America's struggling with. He says in 1967 alone the average cost of a hospital room in America increased 15% and he writes other countries are doing better and most of them have some form of socialized medicine. The United States is extraordinarily backwards in this respect however many clear-headed American observers have looked at European socialized systems and have come away shaking their heads and there is a widespread doubt whether any European system can be adapted to this country. Very likely America will have to work out its own system. The combination of group insurance with a group practice system, essentially the system at Kaiser and others, seems a feasible ec economical and practical method acceptable both to doctors and patients. Without question, the notion of the doctor as a legitimate fee-for-service entrepreneur making his fortune from the misfortunes of his patients is old-fashioned, distasteful and doomed. It is only a question of time. And he wrote that in 1967 or whatever and it's kind of still happening. It's a bit depressing to be honest. So a John C. Warren, and this is 103 years before Lucchese, so what, in 1860 odd, he wrote, surgery has ceased to be the spectacular occupation it once was. It is impossible to miss the regret in his words, but he did not mean it regretfully, for he was talking about the difference anesthesia had made to surgery. In other words, he thought that anesthesia was a bad thing. So I'm going to move on to Sylvia Thompson now. And I just thought that was interesting because he was talking about computing power and how that will change healthcare. And he was sort of spot on with that, you know. And then we're going to move on to Edith Murphy. And I just thought this was interesting. Um, so um, somebody said, um, tell me about his kidneys, not his marital troubles. And the, certain, the visit was right. The hospital is geared to treat his kidneys and not his arguments with his wife. This same argument has been made by Peter Drucker concerning undergraduate liberal arts colleges where he points out that professors of English or history are not training liberal humanitarians or anything else so noble. They are training future professors of English and history. And that's what the joke always was when I was at university, that if you study creative writing, the only thing it qualifies you to become is a teacher in creative writing. So Five Patients by Michael Crichton, fascinating non-fiction book. It would particularly appeal to me because I've uh, written a book with a client called The Future of Healthcare. And it was just really cool to see what Crichton thought the future of healthcare was back in the late 60s and to compare that with where we are today. Really interesting stuff. I gave this a solid four out of five. I don't think it's a book that will interest everyone, but um, if you're interested in healthcare and the healthcare industry, definitely check it out. So there we have it, Five Patients by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.